So thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to present uh, uh, this talk today on the animal models. Uh, it's not going to be so much focused on, uh, on our work, but of course there are some elements, but also we're going to uh, look a little bit into this general evidence of the vascular involvement. And as you can see, as opposed to the title, I added a little bit of a question mark. I think we still are not really uh, sure how to attack this in, uh, uh, in animal models. And just to give a little bit of introduction when we talk about this uh, vasculature, I think we also need to revisit and, and focus a little bit on what we know about the involvement of the vasculature uh, in migraine in general. And although there are some uh, discussions uh, pre-1940s also on the involvement of the vasculature in, uh, in migraine, a lot of the work we're based on is based on the hypothesis from uh, Wolf that uh, when you stimulated the vasculature on the dura, you got a pain feeling that was similar to what could be experienced as uh, in migraine attacks. And kind of this was a lot of how the investigation started on understanding uh, the migraine uh, pathology, and it was really linked into this uh, vascular uh, hypothesis. And then this developed over the, over the years, and especially in the 70s, there were really a lot of progress in the, in the field of, uh, uh, of migraine uh, research, but it actually didn't start as migraine research, it was the discovery of all the uh, neuropeptides. So uh, at first, the uh, VIP, the vasointestinal peptide, uh, was discovered, and later also, for example, substance P, neuropeptide Y. And what was very interesting with a lot of these uh, uh, peptides is that they were, let's see if I can get this to work, is that they are expressed on the surface of different arteries. So, of course, the link into different type of uh, diseases and the sensory mechanisms was really started by knowing that these neuropeptides, they could have an involvement also uh, with the vasculature. <clears throat> and of course, maybe one of the most interesting and the one that triggered uh, a lot of the uh, research and, and the medicines that we today have in migraine uh, research is uh, CGRP. And when CGRP was first discovered, it was seen that it was doing this vasodilation uh, on the arteries. And this is what you can see uh, up here. So you have some arteries that you pre-constrict. Here's the PGF to alpha, the constrictor that Masoud also mentioned in the first lecture. And when you add CGRP, you can see that the artery is phosphodilate. Also, CGRP, the, uh, the peptide stains in the sensory fibers near the artery. These are from some of the original data that uh, Lars Edvinson was, uh, was doing. But you can see when you do it with modern antibodies, you get a very similar uh, picture. So in that way, CGRP was started. It matched very well with this vascular hypothesis uh, to begin with, and that CGRP could have a uh, potential involvement then in, in migraine or in other diseases of the uh, vasculature. And uh, of course you might have a hypothesis that it might be working uh, uh, in this way in migraine, but some of the first and, and really good studies, and of course here we have also some models uh, were used in cats or in the, also in humans when there was a trigeminal uh, stimulation, show that when you, stud, when you uh, trigger the trigeminal ganglion in animals or in humans, you get release of some of these neuropeptides. So it really showed that at the beginning this trigeminal vascular system, that when you stimulate the trigeminal vascular system, you get release of neuropeptides. But as you can see here, you get both uh, CGRP, but also substance P, which is an important uh, neuropeptide in the trigeminal vascular system. And where did it sort of start to move away a little bit from, uh, from the vasculature uh, is when uh, the studies with using the triptans, of course CGRP again was increased in, in during the migraine attack, but what was really interesting is that the triptans did not only cause the constriction, they also reduced the CGRP. So I think this is really what one of the, one of the key elements that started to discuss, are we really looking on CGRP on the vasculature, or are we looking at CGRP based on what is happening with the nerves? And I think still we are a little bit in uh, in this question in the, in the migraine field, whether these effects are triggered uh, from, first of all, from the CNS, but when even in the periphery is it the vasodilation that leads to uh, uh, some of these pain mechanisms or is it uh, CGRP? So, to some extent, I think we need to also, when we talk about uh, the involvement of the vasculature, what is the evidence of vasculature involvement in humans, and how do we translate this also into the animal models? 
So there are some evidence for the vascular involvement in humans. Of course, for centuries, it was believed to be this vascular disorder. You had the pain when you touched the uh, uh, arteries. You have observed intracranial dilation during the genuine uh, migraine attacks. You can induce migraine-like uh, uh, headache in, uh, in migraine nerves with a different set of vasodilators, such as CGRP, puck up, and nitric oxide. And also very interesting, a lot of the genetic studies that we have show a lot of vascular genes potentially being involved. But what leads us to um, sort of still question that what type of issues remain? Well, one thing that I would like to highlight is that the throbbing that you see in migrant patients do not seem to match the arterial pulse. So that is, a, <clears throat> to some extent, a bit maybe surprising. And then not all vasodilators give migraine. For example, VIP, which uh, Masut also talked about in the earlier studies, it did not give the migraine-like attacks, but in newer studies, when you do a longer uh, exposure, you can see migraine-like phenotypes. And I will get into that a bit, how that can maybe be explained also in, by using some animal models. And then you have acetylcholine. It's a very different vasodilate from the other ones. It's not a neuropeptide, and most likely vasodilates using, through the endothelium. So in that way, it's very different. But it did not give a migraine attack. So maybe there is still something with what type of signaling molecules you need, what type of vasodilators, what type of mechanisms, but it's not set absolutely in stone, this link between the, between the vasodilation and the migraine, but it's between certain vasodilating uh, compounds that, that give the migraine phenotype. Just to bring on the, uh, on the patient part, <clears throat> there is a little bit contrasting evidence looking at different type of, uh, of arteries. But I would say that the likelihood of, of vasodilation occurring in the patient uh, seemed to be stronger now than it was uh, some years ago, and especially highlighting the change here in the middle meningeal artery, that you have a vasodilation in the, uh, in the patient on the pain-related uh, uh, side. So in that way, there's a lot of links with the, with, the, with the vasculature and the vasodilation in the human data, and then the question is also how do we uh, take this on to uh, the current model that we are working on uh, in the animals. Uh, in our view and in our group, uh, we've, oops, uh, we focus a lot on uh, potential hypothalamic uh, activation, and I think that uh, most of us agree that there is some type of CNS element also uh, in migraine uh, pathology. But nevertheless, if it's starting in the CNS, we all also know that uh, most likely the antibodies work outside the brain, and that they mitigate the pain, most likely to criminal vascular system. And it really brings us down to the question here, is there any vascular involvement, or is it really an epiphenomenon? Because we know CGRP is released, and CGRP causes the vasodilation, but what is really the chicken and the egg? What can start the, the real migraine attack? And when we are doing these infusion models, are we mimicking the start of a migraine attack or the pain, and in this way? And then that will take us to uh, the animal models. But I think that the question that we really need to ask when we are trying to translate these uh, animal models, is it the effect of the signaling compound that we use, or is it really vascular involvement? And that's really difficult to, to answer both in, in humans and also in, uh, in the animals. And that's why I think in the animal models we struggle with a lot of the same issues determining if there is a vascular involvement or a neuronal activation in humans or is it the same uh, in animals? And of course, with animals, we have an even stronger problem that we cannot ask them if they experience any migraine pain like you can do in the patients. And also, we, we really know that the vasculature and the nerves, they are really interrelated uh, when it comes to, uh, to the physiology also of, uh, of regulation of blood flow. So it is really uh, a system that communi cross-communicates a lot also in in humans and animals. And just to, to highlight it a bit, the CGRP, is it the cause or the effect of the migraine attacks? Because probably you have some type of uh, stimuli that releases the CGRP to begin with. And I think this is one of the key things that we really need to look into into understanding migraine pathology. If we know that CGRP is important, we know it is increased, what is really causing the CGRP to occur in the first place. What really releases the first CGRP? Because we can argue if it's uh, vasculature involvement, is it vasodilation, 
but what we can probably all agree on is CGRP is important and somehow it's released. And really how this release happens, I think, is, is, the, key, uh, is the key point. And we'll talk about, and you heard a bit about it, the trigeminal vascular system, so the trigeminal nerves that, of course, goes in and innervates the venereal vasculature. And then when we talk about the signaling pathways that Masut also showed very nicely, you have, of course, CGRP and the receptor, cyclic AMP, and relaxation uh, of the arteries. This, of course, becomes a little bit more complex when you talk about the, the neuronal activation, and I think that we really need some good experiments here to, to link together the, the data that we have. And there's, again, just pointing the same uh, issue here with the neurogenic inflammation. So you have potential, you have vasodilation that can cause the neuronal activation, or you have a neuronal activation that can cause vasodilation. And this is really the key thing that we, we don't understand is what is leading to what here? Because we know that both these things occur because you cannot really have pain without neurons being activated, but you also see the vasodilation and the dilation effects uh, of the arteries. And I think this is really the key point of trying to find out uh, what is first, or maybe it's not even first, maybe it's uh, just um, cross-communication and, and both elements are, uh, are really needed. <clears throat> so I chose some uh, animal models to discuss and see what do we know about the uh, vascular involvement uh, in these models. Uh, it was mentioned uh, briefly also in the, in the beginning, in the first talk. So it's the cortical spreading depression. It's the uh, potential of this electrical stimulation. Uh, it's the injection and application models, and also some uh, in vitro models. So we'll start with some uh, data from uh, the group of Burstein that is uh, looking into some of the effects of cortical spreading depression. And they have also used here the Tamanusumab, the antibody that uh, uh, binds to, to CGRP. And one of the original arguments was that this cortical spreading depression triggers this neurogenic inflammation. And uh, what was shown in this study was that the cortical spreading depression it triggers this plasma protein extravasation. Um, and that uh, CGRP itself did not uh, induce this protein uh, extravasation. But what you can see also up here is that premonizumab itself did not inhibit uh, any of these uh, effects. Well, of course, this is this uh, uh, plasma extravasation, but more interesting is the uh, vasculature. And as you can see here on, the, on this slide, when you triggered uh, the cortical spreading depression and you got a vasodilation, this vasodilation could not be inhibited by flamonosumab. So it seems like at least the direct link between the cortical spreading depression and dilation of the arteries is not straightforward. And as a control experiment, they also showed here that the dilation by CGRP itself could uh, easily be inhibited by the antibody. And then they presented some type of working hypothesis and model, as you can see here. And, and it comes to some part of, of, if not a problem, but that the activation of CGRP and the neutralization and the secondary step, and the same also with these other potential events, is that the CGRP dependent activation sort of comes downstream. So in their view, there is some type of link with the CGRP and preventing the pain, but maybe all the way down on the neuronal level and might not be in the cortical spreading depression, at least directly involved in this acute vasodilation that is by the, uh, by the cortical spreading depression. Then, although electrical stimulation is not the focus of this uh, lecture, I just wanted to bring out some few uh, elements. There is several models of electrical stimulation, and a lot of these, of course, go into the neurons and not directly into the, um, the link to the, uh, to the vasculature. But some of the models have a link also to the vasculature, particularly when you look at the stimulation on the, uh, on the dura. So this method here, which is, uh, in my opinion, maybe one of the best uh, models to study a lot of the mechanisms in uh, uh, in migraine because it involves a lot of the mechanisms that we know are linked to the pathology, but without including the pain. So what you do in this study is, uh, in these studies, you, you drill the skull very, very thin, and then you can see here that this is the meningeal artery, and then you put two electrodes on each side of the artery, and you induce an electric field. One of the problems, just to mention it, is of course you stimulate all the neurons that are around, so it's not a CGRP 
specific release, but you will stimulate the sensory fibers. And then by using uh, software, you can use and measure the diameter of the artery. And here you really have a small laboratory of a lot of the factors that you actually see uh, in migraine. You have stimulation of nerves next to the vasculature and you can observe the vasodilation uh, as your outcome. And uh, one very good example is a study from 2006 where they used uh, uh, CGRP antagonist and also uh, sumatriptans. And you can see that you get uh, vasodilation when you uh, or they use ET1 as a preconstrictor to make sure that the artery is constricted enough to see the dilation. And when you stimulate with the electric current, you get a dilation that is um, uh, dependent on, uh, on CGRP. And the same also that it's dependent uh, by the triptans. So it really shows that this model, you can get the expected effects of CGRP uh, antagonist and also the expected uh, uh, effect from triptans. And in this way, I think it really mimics uh, on, the, on a kind of molecular in vivo level some of the pathology of, um, of migraine. Then you can take this to a little bit different uh, step, and it's not, uh, the problem here is you don't see this vasodilation. So instead you actually just measure the, the CGRP. But again, you can show here in this uh, hemiscal model where you collect uh, fluid from the inside of the, of the skull from the dura you get a very nice release with potassium stimulating the nerves, and you can again inhibit it with triptans. So I think what we are really looking for is here is, is there some type of models where we can use the knowledge we have of the clinical compounds that work and see if we can apply it in animal models and really study their, uh, the molecular effects. And then we're just going from, so if you now have this one, we can study CGRP release, but then we can also study the vasculature. And this is, of course, one of the benefits, again, with animal models. We have access to a lot of, uh, of tissue, and we can set up uh, control experiments. And just briefly, how can we then study the vasculature uh, by itself? So you put the arteries in the, with two wires in between. You put them in the myograph uh, bath, where you have two wires through, where you put the tension on the artery, and then you can add different compounds and check vasoactive responses uh, of the arteries and make very nice dose response curves. So in this way, you can really look at what is happening isolated on vasculature. And of course, you can also use uh, human arteries if you have uh, those ones available to really check what are these compounds doing. And I think that one of the most important part of, of the myography here, it's a lot of the signals that are common for vasodilation and nerves uh, will give some of the same indications. So in this way, you can maybe use the artery as a bit of a, of a proxy for what is happening in the trigeminal vascular system, which I will get back to in a, in a few slides. But the myograph, these data are from uh, human meningeal arteries, but of course you can do it also on animals. And here you can see that Elnumab, the antibody that is binding the CGRP receptor, also shifts the dilation to CGRP. So here you can also study some of the direct vascular mechanisms of the compounds that we know how they are working. And just to show a little bit interesting, we were discussing this with the uh, up and the VIP. You can see here that some of the dilation for up it's earlier and it's more sensitive. For VIP, you need a bit longer time. So you can actually use some of the animal models and the arteries, maybe to find out something about receptor kinetics. How much do you need of the compound to really get the vasodilation effects and sort of the, to determine, maybe in, to start off in animals, what type of concentrations would be, uh, would be optimal to use also in, uh, for example, human studies. And then there is uh, another model that is one of the most uh, used models also to, uh, to, to look at uh, migraine-like uh, phenotypes. And it's one of the most used and trustworthy methods to provoke these migraine-like headaches in humans, but also in uh, animals. So um, you inject this uh, uh, nitroglycerin, and it in increases these pro-inflammatory mediators, but can we still use it to conclude on vascular involvement? And I think there's some very nice data from this model that shows that you have uh, changes in the, uh, that you can both use triptans and also use uh, uh, inhibitors against CGRP, so it really matches the effect that we see in the migraine patients. And also, when you look at the neuromodels with these potassium channels, 
then you also have the effect uh, that uh, the CGRP is involved. But again, is it CGRP or vasculature? I think it really is difficult to, to use it to, uh, to answer that question. Just briefly on this model as well, it also becomes relatively complex when you start looking at it, but it is clear that CGRP is involved, but you also need some type of secondary CGRP signal to, to explore it, and it's difficult to say whether it's really the vasculature or if it's the, uh, if it's the neurons uh, also in this model, and we, we need some more tools on that. The information model that we have, uh, we see that when you add inflammatory compounds, you get maybe a small vasoconstriction, nothing from the, uh, uh, nothing down here, actually, this is from the uh, CFA, and you can see that you still get neuronal activation. So it seems like you can get neuronal activation also without the, uh, the inflammation part, uh, also without the dilation part. So what I think we can maybe say that animal models, they can be used maybe as a proxy. So it's for hypersensitivity. We can look at dilation of the arteries. We can look at CGRP release. But what really might be the key is that the arteries and the neurons in animals can be used, as you see here, for example, for the adrenaline, uh, for the adrenaline system, is that the neur neurons and the vasculature often have similar mechanisms. So looking at the artery, you can maybe get an idea of what the neurons will do, because they often act in synergy. And the same with the neurons, you can get to know what they do by looking at the arteries. And it's really a system where the compounds probably causing vasodilation will lead to CGRP release or inhibit constrictors and the other way around. So maybe that is really the key for the animal uh, models. So what can we use it for? We can use it to test the current pathology, such as, for example, with the GTN model. Does it work with the triptans, the CGRP antagonist, as we expect? But maybe what I find more interesting uh, for me is what can we get to know about the mechanisms in animal models? For example, we know CGRP is involved. How can we study these mechanisms of CGRP? And just very briefly, one of the ideas that come out when you're looking at animals, what you cannot do in humans, is uh, our current uh, idea that the CGRP receptor are also in these nodes of Ranvier uh, in the nerves. And these nodes, they are the nodes that are conducting the A-delta fiber uh, pain. So here we can suddenly start looking at mechanisms and seeing what can CGRP be doing without needing the pain as an outcome. And one of the ideas could be that in these nodes, so in the high uh, conductance uh, area that you have in the A-delta fibers, there might be CGRP receptors and uh, CGRP uh, uh, release. And we have this very nice uh, figure here where we find that CGRP is also close to the nodes. And really by just looking in animals and trying to find out what does CGRP do, what, what happens when you activate it in the, in the brain, looking at the nerves, looking at the vasculature, and understanding what does CGRP do without maybe necessarily looking into the pain mechanisms. Because I think the pain mechanisms and migraine pain might be better to do in patients when we have found uh, the targets. So this is currently one of the models uh, that uh, we are working on, where you have CGRP being released and potentially activating and sensitizing the neuronal system. So you have CGRP effects in the periphery, activating uh, at least arteries, maybe also the, um, uh, uh, the mast cells you have maybe in the ganglion itself, maybe in the fiber, but really try and understand CGRP, what does it do uh, in animals? And finally, uh, the summary. So um, we have been looking a little bit on, on what can we use animal models for. And I think this discussion on the uh, vascular involvement is maybe even more complex in humans because we do not really know if the animals have a headache. And maybe instead of necessarily discussing the headache, we should look at into uh, these mechanisms because a lot of the same vascular mechanisms, the signaling compounds, the uh, effects of CGRP, and the fact we can do knockout of receptors and really look at how these systems work in the healthy animals. So we can use it to understand the mechanisms that are established and things that we know from in humans. And by doing that, maybe we can find new pathways. So if we find out how CGRP is released and we found key elements in this pathway, then we can use those targets and maybe test it in, uh, uh, test it in humans. So can you really study migraine in animals? I think that might be the, the tricky solution, and that also links to if you can really study vasculature and the vascular involvement. 
but for sure you can study the mechanisms. And maybe when you focus on animal models, it could be a good idea to try to really understand mechanisms and regulations behind without necessarily needing the question of does it lead to pain and what type of pain do we study. And uh, with that, let's say conclusion, I'm uh, open to questions. Thank you, Christian, for a very nice presentation. Next on, we will uh, have some Q&As, and we will start with one question from the audience here, and then we will move forward to another question from the viewers, and then we change. Okay? Hi, I'm Dr. Chengdo, MD, and Mrs. Farrell at the Dentian Center. First of all, thank you for an excellent talk. I was especially intrigued by your uh, points on using antagonism in animal models of migraine. You uh, discussed that there may be a CGRP feedback rule, or that may be a CGRP crosstalk based on animal data showing that uh, CGRP antagonism can block GTN, cellulosic and so on. Professor Yes Olsen demonstrated that a CGRP antagonist could block uh, CGRP, or could not, yeah, could block CGRP in, or could not, oh, sorry, could not block GTN induced migraine in a human model. What are your thoughts on this? I think this is, is really what, what we're looking for, and I think for the animal models, if you can find that in the animal models those mechanisms work, you can use this model to study the mechanisms. But they don't, they don't necessarily need to be the same as you see in the, in the humans. And I think we need to try maybe to separate a little bit to, to what is the aim of our animal study. Because if these mechanisms work in the animal, it could be good to study exactly those mechanisms, although they might be different from what we see uh, in the humans. But then, of course, when things are not fully matching, you should also have extra care in extrapolating the data to humans. So, for example, looking for new targets in animal models, when you use a model, although it matches, for example, the parameters, let's say, triptans, and it matches CGRP antagonist, that does not necessarily mean that this model is good for understanding and finding new potential targets. Because finding the new targets might not involve the same mechanisms that you have in your model. So your model is really limited to, to study the mechanisms of, uh, of the agonist and antagonist that you, you use. And I think it can, for many animal models, this extrapolating to humans, it really needs to be the same model. And that is not necessarily answered by using uh, the same agonists and antagonists. Thank you for your answer. Well, we don't have any questions on the screen here, so we will move forward to uh, the next. Thanks for your presentation. I'm Yixing from Danish Headache Center. I have uh, one question about um, because the present uh, human model and the treated migraine is all about the episodic form of migraine. How to translate this theory like the vasodilation or the activation of a nociceptor? Uh, nociceptive receptors in managing arteries to the chronic form of migraine because this is more common in clinical work. And, uh, and I have another question because I noticed your presentation about the behavior studies all about the adodynia. Do you have another solid evidence to pre predict that this animal is having a migraine rather than other kind of headache or just like a transmineral or transmineral neuroallergia things? Uh, for the first part, uh, for this chronic migraine, we are doing some uh, experiments. For example, I think this uh, inflammatory soup and the Freud's adjuvant is also really trying to mimic some of these uh, ideas that you can use these compounds to trigger inflammation uh, in the trigeminal ganglion and at least uh, trigger some type of hypersensitivity of the trigeminal ganglion, trigeminal vascular system. But again, this only mimics some parts and it really answers like what type of phenotype behavior will you get from an overly active and inflamed trigeminal vascular system. So I think some of those aspects can, can be involved in, in the chronic part, but we're still really in the early, early phases on this, uh, on this chronic uh, part of the stimulation. And the second one again, briefly. The second one is is there any other solid evidence to prove yeah. the rats have the migraine rather than and other kind of the headache? 
I think this is also really difficult because if you just look at humans that do not have migraines, they usually do not get migraines even when you stimulate them with CGRP uh, infusions or other mechanisms. So are we really sure that healthy, typically male rats in their early 20s, if you compare to humans, can have migraine? And for that, I'm not sure. So that, that is also a really, really important question. Are we studying allodynia, head pain, or are we studying migraine? And I think that's why if we just focus on mechanisms, we can move a little bit away from the discussion, whether it's migraine or head pain, but instead focus on how can we control, for example, the, the mechanisms of CGRP and CGRP release and those ones, rather than discussing whether they have migraine, headache, or allodynia. Of course, it is interesting to have some type of behavioral outcome, but it's not absolutely necessary to, to understand some of the, of the mechanisms behind the pathology. Thank you. Then we have a question from the viewers, and this is, I don't know if I will pronounce correctly, but Eva uh, Skapinska, <laughs> uh, CPP, and she asked, uh, if uh, fragmentism does not work on CSD, which uh, is clear to me, and logically explain how can we explain uh, that in our patient it does seem to work uh, as a preventive medication for both migraine with and without aura. Thank you very much for the for the question. I'm not going to go into a detailed discussion on the cortical spreading depression and uh, the evidence for this and the difference between the, the migraine with and without the aura. Uh, I think it seems to be quite clear that CGRP is involved and I think what they in, in this current paper also try to, to get to their conclusion is that it does not inhibit the vasodilation, but it potentially inhibits the neurons. And then we can also start asking, is it so that, for example, in the migraine with aura, there is some different mechanisms and different involvements of the vasculature compared to the one without aura? But that is, again, a little bit different, uh, different field. But it seems like CGRP is still involved both in the migraine with aura and the one without aura. The question is, where is the CGRP involved? Is it neurons, vasculature, somewhere in, the, in between? So I think that's... That's really, uh, thank you, sort of answers that. Mohammed. Kristen, thank you very much for the nice presentation. My name is Mohammed al from from the Danish Lake Center. Uh, you mentioned that direct stimulation of trigeminal ganglion uh, leads to a release of CGRP and the white fibers surrounding the vessels. If my mind served me correctly, uh, uh, I read that also direct stimulation leads to release of CGRP uh, from fibers in the trigeminal nucleus caudatus, right? So uh, I'm wondering if we only induce vasodilation, which this vasodilation can lead to CGRP release in the trigeminal nucleus caudatus, the only vasodilation. This is the first question, and the second question, do you think there is a difference between the synthetic arteries compared to arteries uh, 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 all over the body? You know, because when we do the human models of migraine, we, we induce vasodilation also in the arms, you know, maybe also in the vessels in the legs, but we don't, the, the patients don't report any pain there. They only report synthetic pain. This is the second question, thank you. Thanks. Um... I think for the for the second part of, of this question, with the difference, uh, the origin of the uh, why it is specific to the hand, I think it could have something to do with the neuron, uh, neurogen, like the origin when we are being developed, that the head has a different uh, uh, origin of the of the stem cells during body development. That could be that could be one uh, element to it, and also that uh, maybe this trigeminal vascular link is somehow stronger maybe in the head region than what we have in other parts of the body. Uh, one of the original hypotheses was, of course, that there is no space for these arteries to dilate in contrast to, uh, uh, to the rest of the body. And that might be also a part of explaining why you can have this vasodilation pain caused in the, in the head, but not in, in, uh, in other parts. But I think also for this, um, uh, for this CGRP induced, for example, migraine, how can you, you, we don't assume that the CGRP at least itself will reach, for example, the TNC. It could, of course, activate the, the neurons. But I think this idea that uh, the dilation itself, and when you, when you induce the dilation, and potentially release of, uh, for example, potassium and local depolarization to activate the nerves, that that could be really something to, to look into. And then the main question then that we come back to is, is this what happens in migraine, or it is what happening when you stimulate 
with uh, injection of, uh, of CGRP. And that is also going to be a really a chicken egg discussion here is, is yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, because I was, was wondering about that also regarding the, the uh, cell population that gives the, the vessels, the cranial vessels, the synthetic vessels. These cells are crystal cells, you know, from the development. Yeah. But these cells also give us some of the vessels in the, uh, 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 in the medulla. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we don't report any back pain when we have the patients. So, so maybe there is another reason. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering. You know? uh, <coughs> for me, I have one, one sort of hypothesis that it, why, why do we only have it in the head? It might have something to do that we are uh, uh, animals that are standing up. Our brain is not protected very well from sensing pain and heat. So maybe our cranial vasculature and our foreheads have developed into being more sensitive to sensory feedback. So since the brain cannot know what it is overheating because it doesn't have the heat sensors, maybe our uh, dura is extra sensitive. And that could link very well into, for example, the heat sensitivity, capsaicin-induced CGRP release, that maybe we are just extra sensitive uh, in our dura region compared to the rest of the body because we don't have good sensory uh, input in our brain to protect us from, from damage. And that might be why it is special to, to all the other, uh, other areas. Thank you. Then we have another question. Could both mechanisms be involved together, neuronal CGRP and, the, and also the vascular mechanism? Migraine mechanisms uh, may not be simple or always the same for all patients. Yeah, and I think that also brings into a really a large discussion. Are all migraine patients the same? And as Masut also said, is it all about the threshold disease? Could it all be CGRP that some are more sensitive, less sensitive? Is it all neuropeptides? I think we don't really know. But for me, at least, there seems to be, there must be some type of neuronal compound. And the vascular compound, I think it is there as well. The question is, what happens first? So I would say, are there vascular mechanisms I think it's a really, really good proxy for the CGRP release that Masut is also uh, using. We can measure the dilations of these arteries in patients. And there is no better indication that you have local CGRP effects than you see vasodilation in the meningeal arteries. And, and I think that adds a lot to the value of, of the model and also why I think this model of the electrical stimulation and actually monitoring the meningeal, meningeal artery in animals is really, really good because it's so similar to the mechanisms that we see also in the humans for the dilation, and it can maybe add to some of the translation between uh, between those two. But probably it is part of both, and uh, they're linked. Mona, thank you, thank you for a nice presentation. I also agree that you can study mechanisms <coughs> with animal models, and my question is regarding sex differences. Do you also think we can use animal models to study more sex-specific mechanisms? So there are these nice, interesting results from McGill University showing microglial cell mediated pain versus T cell in male and female rats. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's, it's exactly the same uh, idea as well that some of the mechanisms, I think what is, we are struggling a bit with animals is that the cycle is very short. So that of course gives some limitations, but really to look into just what estrogens are doing in general. I think this is what we can ask. And we, do we really need pain to be able to answer that question? I don't think we need to. We, need, we know where to look for, uh, for these targets. We know that the trigeminal vascular system is a very likely uh, target. So we can look at what does estrogen do? What are male-female differences, like the basic differences in vasculature, in the neurons, in the trigeminal vascular system, <coughs> without necessarily answering the question of pain? And maybe if we find some of those ones, we can take it to the humans and see, is this really mechanism more important in females with migraine, or is it something that got lost in translation between the, between the models? Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Eva. Uh, thank you for your answer, but patients treated with femorizumab experience the reduction of aura itself, not only pain. I think this is, this is also a little bit of a question for a debate because uh, at least some migraine patients on the antibodies, they also report that they feel everything of the migraine except the pain. Uh, so I don't know if this is something that has been done a really good uh, controlled study. Uh, 
study on this one, and I think it's needed a really good control study to see which symptoms mm -hmm. disappears with the treatment of the of the antibody. And I think that is currently not uh, yeah. available. Yeah, I think it's an important point, Christian, you made because the question is relevant, but there is no evidence. Okay, maybe some patients report that because aura was not rigorously registered in all clinical trials. The only thing that we know that patients with a history with aura, in addition to migraine without aura, they respond as well as the patient without history of aura. But whether it has a C effect on aura symptoms in, in terms of prevention of aura, we don't have data yet. But maybe we'll see. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Sanak uh, Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, should I actually share my Okay, sorry. My name is Sanak Thank you for an excellent presentation. I think it's very interesting this uh, trigeminal ganglion hypothesis about CGRP being released from C fibers to A delta fibers. But I'm really struggling to understand why. Because, I mean, we have. C fibers and A delta fibers, and they should be activated to protect us from tissue damage and so on. But why is it necessary for the CGRP to be released from C fibers to then lead to like a positive mechanism that would lead to activation of A delta fibers? What is the physiological meaning uh, of, of this apparent mechanism? Um. Yeah, I think this leads into sort of the continued step also of this uh, potential hypothesis as the neuropeptides as uh, modulators. Because what is, I think is quite interesting with, when you give the CGRP antibodies, the patients do not lose all the senses of pain. So they don't, do not lose sensitivity of heat pain or any other type of pain. And why do they not lose the pain? Because they don't have communications anymore in their C fibers. But maybe what they lose is sensitization. So that the CGRP that is released from the nodes in the ganglion, in the periphery, sensitizes the nerves. So, for example, when you have tissue damage, it hurts more. And maybe this is some of the mechanisms, and that the actual neurotransmitters in the C-fibers is not CGRP. So that's why you can still feel pain, but you do not have the sensitization. And in that way, the migrant patients, they actually can still feel all types of pain, but they do not have the sensitization that is maybe pivotal to, uh, to the migraine attack. My name is Anas Brown. Thank you for a nice presentation. Also, very interested in this neuronal versus peripheral uh, CGRP. We put out some data last year from the Brigitte study showing that uh, monoclonal antibody against uh, CGRP was uh, very fast in alleviating uh, relieving pain. I noticed in all your sketches, on all the models here, we constantly put CGRP outside the lumen, so outside the res uh, respiratory. Does the fact that a monoclonal antibody that allegedly would not cross the blood brain barrier and stay within the lumen, would that sort of draw that cartoon into question by saying maybe there's actually a uh, predominance of effects of CGRP in the actual bloodstream and the site of action is really there and it is in fact a peripheral mechanism? Uh, I think also here you need to separate at least a little bit the different type of arteries because, for example, for the cerebral arteries like the MCA, also like Masuk showed, if you infuse CGRP, you don't see dilation effects. And I think that's why you also probably will not see any antibody effects on the, uh, for example, on the MCA. But for example, for the meningeal and the peripheral arteries, they are more permeable. So there the antibody would also be on the, on the outside of the lumen and could capture CGRP from uh, both sides. So I think this is really why we think that a lot of the effects that we see are outside of the blood-brain barrier, because the, the transport of these antibodies into the brain is at least very limited. There is still discussion whether they can be transported and if there is any opening of this blood-brain barrier, maybe during migraine attacks. But I think most of the data suggests, also with infusion models, that uh, the triggering of this pain and the migraine can at least be triggered from the periphery and that the antibodies most likely work uh, in the periphery. And maybe also to the link of a lot of the symptoms that remain are CNS maybe like symptoms so that you have the feeling of the migraine but you take the pain away. 
and that the pain is somehow coming from the periphery. But that does not necessarily mean that migraine is a peripheral disorder, but that the pain input is coming from somewhere outside of the, of the CNS, at least. Thank you. We have no more time for any other questions. So uh, thank you very much, Christian. Thank you. Uh,